I'd like to start us off by acknowledging that this virtual presentation is taking place throughout the unceded territory of California, home to nearly 200 tribal nations. In particular, I'm speaking to you from Half Moon Day, which is, sits on Ramaytush Ohlone land. We acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions, and we encourage you to learn which tribal nations are indigenous to the area where you are now living. One excellent source of information is native land, and we're gonna drop the link into the chat that you can explore later if you haven't done so already. We're excited to introduce three speakers to you today. Dr. Adina Marinlinder is the founding director of the California Naturalist Program, a key member of the UC Climate Stewards core team and a UCANR cooperative extension specialist, as well as adjunct professor at UC Berkeley. Last but not least, Dr. Marylander is here today to discuss her recent book, the UC Climate Stewards textbook, Climate Stewardship, Taking Collective Action to Protect California. As the UC Climate Stewards Academic Coordinator, I am really grateful for Dr. Marylander's hard work and dedication to bring together our course handbook by weaving together these incredible stories of communities, ecosystems, and resilience with the science of climate and climate solutions. We also are welcoming two special guest book contributors today. David Diaz is the executive director at Active San Gabriel Valley, and Tracy Bartlett is a certified naturalist and climate steward from UC Riverside Palm Desert Center and also a founding member of the Cactus to Cloud Institute. Welcome to our of our speakers today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Jeremy. Great. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak about climate stewardship today, and a special thanks to Obi Kaufman for collaborating on the book. I get an opportunity to share his beautiful paintings with you in this talk, uh, as well as uh, feature them in the book. It's hard not to think about uh, wildfire right now, especially if you're living in the northern part of the state. I always like it to think about people like BB or engage with wild, wildfire. As he says, we're terrified of fire, but we don't have to be. Fire can be a good friend or your worst enemy. He really does understand the importance of restoring the use of fire. He first started clearing and underburning his property to bring back the oaks and to foster their um, fertility, especially around acorns. What I love about BB is that he refers to acorns as the plankton of the terrestrial ecosystems. They really are at the base of the food chain for so many species. Also, we know for thousands of years, the traditional burning um, done by indigenous peoples produces a variety of species and age classes. And that this, these resources that were tended through fire often uh, really important food sources, medicine and materials for native people. So we need to restore the use of fire today to address the fuel management issues we're having in some parts of our state, as well as increasing devastated wildfires. Again, this doesn't apply everywhere, but is applies to a lot of our state. Um, Bibi actually learned and, and, and helped start the Plumas Underburn Cooperative um, by hearing a lecture from Lania Quinn Davidson and Jeff Stackhouse. They both work with UC Cooperative Extension and they've been doing just wonderful work in sharing the value of starting a prescribed burn association. So now that there's a Plumas Underburn Cooperative, Bibi's not on his, on his own on his land trying to execute very difficult prescribed burns. Rather, he told me he has a list of 120 volunteers that he can call on who get together, they can, and help with the burns. And of course, have some fun uh, after they're all done of a hard day's work. Well, I also don't need to really uh, say because I think we're all experiencing the fact that these fires that we're having are actually burning a larger areas than they were before. And climate models predict this trend to continue if we continue to emit the level of greenhouse gases that we are emitting today. Uh, so it's the, the devastating wildfires are on the rise and they're burning larger amounts of land. This is coupled with the issue of drought, right? So there are reasons why, you know, why climate change being the larger reason, but uh, then the details, the devil's in the details, and one of them is drought, right? So global climate models are also unanimously projecting increase in drought in, throughout the Southwest. And of course, that 
uh, relates to the warmer temperatures that we've observed. We've raised the global average temperatures have risen um, about one degree C in mid latitudes and somewhere between three to five, depending where you are up in the polar regions. Uh, so we're also experiencing changes in precipitation due to climate change, right? We're having less lighter rainfall events and more atmospheric rivers. We're having less snow and lower snowpack and earlier runoffs. When we combine what we know about temperature with what we know about precipitation, we can come up with these climate metrics. And one of them that's quite useful is climate water deficit, which reflects the difference between how much water plants would use if they had as much water as they'd like to grow and how much they actually have in the soil. So that difference is this deficit. And I like to think of climate water deficit as the way that changes in precipitation and temperature are actually expressed on the landscape. It does influence the amount we have to irrigate crops, it influences forest health, and it influences native plant persistence. Another thing we contend with is, um, is fire weather. And one of the things that we are aware of are fire winds. What's going on here, and it, it's becoming increasingly problematic and increasingly severe related to climate change, is the differences in polar temperatures, which have risen, as I mentioned, to three to five degrees C, and the lower temperature difference between the north, the, uh, the poles, and the mid-latitudes. So the fact that these temperatures are becoming more similar is unleashing, um, basically, the um, you know, it, it's unleashing the, um, the jet stream and the jet stream, instead of circling in a very sort of predictable path is now becoming much more wily. As it brings down those cold air temperatures from the north and becomes more erratic, that creates a pressure differential between the east and the west or the north and the south of the jet stream. As that pressure differential shortens, so the distance between the two different pressures shortens uh, and winds are created. And these winds really pick up from the east and push toward the west. And the speed at which these winds arrive to the Pacific Ocean and to California increase as they traverse across our mountain ranges too. So they get funneled through the mountain ranges so they become faster and drier and more dangerous. And we do observe these mostly in the fall, but we're starting to see this length of season of fire winds increasing. Nobody, um, you know, talking to Michael Galagali, he knows firsthand the experience of these winds uh, because he was living in Pepperwood when fire winds were started. Some of you might have been at our regional rendezvous there in Pepperwood that day when the winds started to pick up the end of the day. And Michael had to rush to get his family out of the reserve and out of their home safely, as well as the neighbors. Uh, so he knows the devastating effects of these fire, fire weather and the conditions that climate change has created. Um, but the other thing is that as the Pepperwood Preserve Manager, he also really understands the regenerative forces of fire and has observed with help from volunteers when they're monitoring the plant communities, how fire can adjust plant communities, can release fire chasers such as this Fremont's death camma that's in this photo. Um, so they find new species after fire and also works with volunteers to figure out how to restore the land after the fire crews have been there, how to work with fire as a tool, how to work with grazing as a tool, how to do thinning and things like that. So they're studying all of these things that are around fire management. Pepperwood has experienced two fires recently and are just trying to really work together as a community to build a more fire resilient uh, ecosystem. It's uh, quite powerful to watch them do their work. Of course, fire can dramatically change the ecosystem uh, in, in, you know, overnight, as was the case of the Tubbs fire. Um, but climate change can also change ecosystems and change species composition in a sense uh, over a longer period of time. And we know that in part from people like Susan Harrison who study communities over long periods of time. And she was looking at grasslands and herbaceous cover in McLaughlin Reserve. It's a natural reserve that UC runs just uh, near Lower Lake, which is right over the mountains from Pepperwood. And what 
Susan Harrison documented was a decline in species that are less drought tolerant. So those fleshy leafy species like clovers, trifolium, what she's seeing is those species are winking out of the natural reserve in McLaughlin. Um, and, and she concluded that this was due to this dramatic decrease over time of soil moisture availability. And that this is a, a even more prevalent on serpentine soils. Uh, many of you know that serpentine soils are important refugia for California's native plants, and but they're also thinner, don't hold moisture as well. And um, it might be that they, th that other areas are, they also have differences in their competition with annual grasses between serpentine and non-serpentine areas. So she did find that. She didn't find an influence of grazing on this. It really was uh, a study that well documented the influence of climate water deficit on species composition. Um, one of the actions that they're taking is Kathy Kohler and the folks at McLaughlin have been very successful at eliminating goat grass, which is an invasive species on serpentine soil that competes for water. So they actually eliminate it from their site and work really hard on those issues as a way of adapting these to make these ecosystems more resilient to the over long term drying that they're observing. Another ecosystem that needs a lot of attention and restoration are California's wetlands. And there's some good reasons for that. This is a picture of tidal wetlands along Highway 37 on the north of San Francisco Bay. And these wetlands uh, serve many purposes. One is they're a natural filter for the um, um, toxins that might be coming down from the freshwater resources. They protect water quality. Um, they help to buffer sea level rise. We know we're experiencing sea level rise and these wetlands are like a big giant sponge. So they're very, very helpful to buffer built environment from the surging tides and sea level rise. They actually sequester more carbon than forests per area. And in part, this is, and it's all soil carbon as compared to forests, which are like a lot of carbons up in the tree. Um, in wetlands, in tidal marshes, the um, carbon is sequestered in the roots and the dying matter, and it actually stays there longer because of salt water. So it's a less active system. The microorganisms have a hard time getting going and don't emit as much carbon dioxide. Um, they're just quieted by the, by the salt water and it slows the system. Um, but one thing that you may know also about wetlands, because you've smelled them before at low tide, is that they can't emit methane. Uh, so managing wetlands um, to reduce both carbon dioxide emissions as well as methane emissions, um, because if you disturb a wetland and start to farm it and things like that, you're back in that carbon emission cycle where you're emitting more carbon. Um, so there's a lot of research going on in this area. There's a group of the people who are involved, there are many people involved in restoring wetlands in the Bay, in the San Francisco Bay and around our state. And in fact, it's really an area that's taken off in the last 20 years. But a group I wanna highlight right now is the Students and Teachers Restoring a Watershed group. Um, here's Josh Sosa, one of the students who participated in this program saying, I helped put some of these trees in. And so I feel like I had this connection. And so Lorette Rogers, who works with Point Blue right now, was a former fourth grade teacher. And um, this exact group has actually restored quite a lot of the wetlands around Highway 37, where you saw that map. Um, and of course, they're also working with landowners. So it takes a lot of different parties um, to make this program happen, but it's focused on grade schoolers getting out onto mostly private lands as a private lands um, landscape and doing the actual restoration. And actually it's been quite powerful since 1992. This program alone has restored 650 restoration projects and they've restored 40 miles of creek um, along, along the creeks of this uh, region in the North Bay. Uh, also, one of the tools that they use and that we all can use is a tool developed by Point Blue, which is a climate smart planting palette. So they have checklists of what to plant where that are already sussed out for what will thrive in that type of habitat and also what will be uh, thriving through climate change. So they're kind of climate wise planting palettes that we all can use um, to do uh, restoration.
And many of these wetlands and riparian areas are very fundamental to creating more permeable landscapes and serve as wildlife corridors. A group got together who decided that um, conserving wildlife corridors was gonna be their priority project. And I was able to speak with Susan Butler Graham, who's the team leader from Others Out Front. And basically she was discussing how before she joined the group, she said, I would get panicked and then I would go into denial because I could not sustain that level of anger and sadness and worry about what I'm gonna to say to my kids in 10 years referring to climate change. Joining the group is essential, then you get fortified. Hearing about what other moms are doing is contagious. Now I don't have to go into denial and shut down I can say, yes, this is horrible. Yes, this is scary, but I'm doing everything I can. And there is Susan on the right, far right of that slide with the Mothers Out Front group. Uh, in deciding to engage, this group decided to engage in protecting Coyote Valley, a really important wildlife corridor between the Santa Ana, between basically the Santa Cruz Mountains and across the valley to Morgan Hill and the Diablo Ranges. And the reason why they thought it was so important to take on as one of their major campaigns in part was when Susan said they were very convinced that they realized that if they didn't protect Coyote Valley soon, which is the south part of San Jose and very threatened by development, it was sort of a one shot thing. It was like now or never. Um, so it became a very important project to Mothers Out Front, and they launched an incredible campaign where they brought young people in to talk to city council members. They um, wrote over, got the public to write over 500 postcards. They dropped these postcards off in the city council members on Mother's Day, which is really neat um, since they're Mothers Out Front. And in the end, they were able really through community action and through this group to convince the San Jose City Council to approve $93 million, um, which had already been sort of um, acquired to do some, some work on behalf of the environment, but they may, managed to allocate that to the Coyote Valley Corridor. And that's really helped this partnership with the Peninsula Open Space Trust and the Santa Clara Valley Open Space be a big success was through this type of community involvement. So why Adina, would we, huh? Uh, just checking in. So we do have a couple of additional speakers and I just wanted to do a quick time check and let you know what, uh, where we are. Great, I'll finish up then. So I'm not gonna go into too much about the importance of wildlife connectivity, but to say that now with climate change, we really need to help species shift their ranges. Um, lastly, I'm going to leave you an example of something that I think everyone can engage with, which is eliminating waste and food insecurity. And there's some good reasons to do that because agriculture actually contributes to a huge amount of greenhouse gases. And there's a lot of food rotting out on farms. So we can all work to reduce and reuse and work through this food hierarchy to try and eliminate food waste and join groups like the one that Jennifer Coderon started called Glean Slow, where you can become a gleaner and take advantage of the food that's already being grown in backyards and farms and make sure it gets to the people who need it, who are often food insecure. And the other group that's doing this very successfully is Ava post Coup with Watts Labor Community Action Team. Uh, as she mentioned, Watts, pe in Watts, people don't have a lot of access to fresh fruit and vegetables. They're suffering from health problems that are caused by the food environment. So if you're in the LA area, I just like to encourage you that if you'd like to volunteer with this wonderful group, get in touch with Watts Labor Community Action. They have a lot of fun things to do with urban gardening, soil remediation, and with um, the wonderful Mudtown farm uh, and market that's really helping the community of Watts. I hope that the 55 other stories in the book will help you to learn, become inspired and take action. Thank you and I'm passing to David. Thank you, Adina. And thank you again for the invite and also for uplifting the work of our organization, Active San Gabriel Valley. Hi everyone, my name is David Diaz. I'm the executive director of active San Gabriel Valley. We are headquartered out of eastern Los Angeles County. 
Uh, so the, the San Gabriel Valley is comprised of 31 cities and four large unincorporated areas. About 2 million people live in this area. Very diverse Latino API community. Our mission is to create a more sustainable, equitable, and livable San Gabriel Valley. You can go ahead and hit the next slide. Um, and for us, really, our vision and the way that we do our work here, um, somebody hit the next slide. There we go. Uh, is through three main ways. One is that we want to make sure that community members' voice is being reflected and heard in the decision-making and planning process. Uh, we truly believe that uh, civic engagement doesn't occur until basic needs are met. And so therefore, uh, we make sure to uh, connect with people in their language uh, and multiple modes of communication to be able to meet people where they are. Um, and also to make it participatory. Later in this presentation, I'm gonna give you an example of what that looks like. Um, we also believe in equity to make sure that uh, we're investing resources in the people that have suffered from the most harm uh, due to environmental injustices, racism, segregation, um, and other policies that have been discriminatory caused harm to community members. And then lastly, through capacity strengthening. So working alongside community members, like the officials, CBOs, and other entities to make sure that we're strengthening the capacity for folks, uh, because we know that it's gonna really take a collective of people to be able to realize the change that we need to see uh, in order to tackle the climate crisis. Go ahead at the next slide. There we go. And so for, this project, uh, which is one example for Active SUV, we really focus on the intersection of energy, transportation, zero waste, water, and other climate related initiatives. Um, but this one example that I want to highlight and uplift with you today is uh, actually the Merced Avenue Greenway project, uh, where in 2010, go ahead at the next slide, um, community members identified Merced Avenue and a couple other streets as being really important. Uh, to transform into multiple benefit corridors that would increase public health, that would increase public safety, that would allow people to connect safely to and from destinations in their community. Uh, the city of South Almonte, where this is located, is actually the city where I grew up in, where my parents still live. Uh, we have some of the poorest health outcomes in all of Valley County. Uh, you know, we're considered a top 10 disadvantaged community by the Karen Viral screen. Uh, due to high poverty rates, uh, high burdens of pollution, high unemployment, high childhood obesity, high adult uh, obesity, and low park space, low educational attainment. Um, and so for me, this project really hit home really closely. And so I'm really fortunate to have worked on this. So in 2010, community members identified Merced Avenue as a potential avenue to construct the multiple benefit project. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so for us, we we took on an untraditional planning process. Usually what we've seen in our experience is that uh, cities or government agencies will propose a 20, 40, 60% design to community and have them react to what they would like to see in their community. Well, we flipped that upside down. We asked community, we started with, what would you like to see in your community? Identifying attitudes around climate, transportation, safety, other concerns to then really develop an approach uh, that was gonna inform the design in an iterative process. Go to the next slide. And so for us, it was uh, multiple project partners. However, it was really two nonprofit partners alongside the city that initiated uh, this whole process, that being uh, the Council for Watershed Health, the city of South Almonte. As you see here, uh, it's been so long since we've been working on this project that we used to have an old, older logo, Ike St. Gable Valley, but we're now active SGV. And then in addition, we work with Climate Resolve, also planning and design Tetra Tech and the Coast Conservancy at the next slide. And this is just to give you an idea of where the project is located. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, and then in particular for Merced Avenue has a couple different uses. The top, the north side being industrial, go ahead to the next slide. The south side being more residential, single family homes. But one of the things that you'll notice here right away looking at it, um, if you see any trees, you know, go ahead and give me a thumbs up on public property, you know, so. This is really a concrete jungle. Uh, the, the urban heat island effect is alive and well here. Go ahead at the next slide. The city of South Almonte has less than 7% urban canopy throughout the entire city. So, you know, you all know that the national average is somewhere around 22, 23%. And so we, we don't have enough urban canopy. Uh, go ahead at the next slide. Uh, and then, then the residential area, you have a mix of multifamily 
uh, mobile home units with single family uh, homes along the way. However, these are multi-generational houses where mo some of the garage space or parking space isn't available. And so we had to find some creative, innovative ways to make sure that the proposed design or what people wanted was being reflected in the final design. Go to the next slide. And so these are our goals really. So pro water quality, heat reduction, public safety and livability. Um, and so for us really, it was about working alongside community to get a community driven planning process and framework done um, so that we can reflect the design that community would wanna see um, in the respective area. Go ahead to the next slide. Okay, next slide. And so some of the things that we want to accomplish here were to capture stormwater, public safety, combat extreme heat, and beautification of the area. Go ahead to the next slide. And so for us, the things that we did here um, for some of the community engagement activities included logo and survey development, city tours. So we actually took uh, city council members, residents, and commissioners from the city of South Amani to another city so that they could see what the demo on a bike tour of another city, Santa Ana, to see what these our greenway improvements could look like so that they would have a better understanding of it. We also developed a multilingual website. We had focus groups with youth, older adults, community members, parents. We had one-on-one -on -one stakeholder meetings. Uh, we did a lot of canvassing. Uh, today, just to refresh my memory, we actually went out in the community to canvas, just canvas, door knock about 36 times to get people's input and feedback um, on the development of this design. Uh, we also had information booths, so going to popular uh, South Almani events. Uh, be present, answer any questions, get people's input and feedback, get presentations at the local schools, um, community-based organizations, digital engagement. And one of the other things that we did was a really cool uh, demonstration. So we actually uh, got equipment to put on Merced Avenue so that folks could see and experience what it would feel like to have that demonstration in their community. Because many times folks say, this works here, but it will never work here because X, Y, and Z. And so for us at Active SGV, it's really important that we're able to provide people with an experience so they could see how it works in the community. So uh, folks actually got a chance to ride their bikes on Merced Avenue in a protected bikeway. Uh, so we let them borrow bikes, they put on helmets, and then we they had an experience survey. How did this feel? What other improvements would you like to see? And all that was captured and reflected in the final design. Um, and so these are some of our uh, outcomes. So multilingual survey, over 100 surveys gathered, we led the city bike tour, ongoing updates. We canvassed the community more than 30 times. Over a dozen walk and bike counts. We often get, well, no one bikes here. You know, why are you doing this in the street? Well, we actually did manual pedestrian and bike counts to then tell people, actually, this many people bike here on the street. And this is when they bike. These are some of the demographics and characteristics of the people who are biking, usually the most vulnerable folks. Um, go ahead and hit, hit the next slide. Um, and so these are just a couple of pictures that I wanted to share with you all. So here, we led a walk and bike tour. So the top picture with people on the bikes, we actually did an environmental scan of people biking on Merced Avenue. We also did a, a walking tour with the folks that you see there. One of the things that we asked, uh, some of the folks that are there are council members. We asked them to count the number of public trees that they found on this 1.1 mile stretch of Merced Avenue. And uh, they found two on a 1.1 mile stretch that were actually belonging to the city of Amari. Go ahead and hit the next slide. Um, and then here, ongoing information booths, go ahead, the next slide, engaging with community members. Uh, this is the community workshop and demonstration event. So as you can see here, we actually, um, this existing kind of green space that's private property, uh, the business owner was polite enough to let us use that space. And so we activated it, we put a couple of games, we put in information booths, we we're taking people surveys, we have poster boards there, the different folks that are part of the project team. So we had water demonstrations that day, we had the engineer there, uh, that day answering questions, go ahead, the next slide. Um, we had kids come out, right? And one of the comments that we got from folks is like, or a community member came up and he was like, oh, look at these kids are riding their bike. You know, he was almost a little bit upset that the kids were riding their bike. Now. But the, the parent that was there wasn't worried about their kid riding up and down the street, which I think to us is the level of safety that we strive for to make sure that, you know, we, didn't need, we don't need to worry about whether our kids can cross the street safely or not. That's the level of safety. And the reality is that there's too much traffic violence in our communities right now that doesn't provide a safe, welcoming atmosphere for people to use other modes that don't include a car. Go to the next slide. And then uh, this is a former mayor here. So she's actually on a tricycle. So again, we try to be inclusive, make sure people of all ages and abilities are able to, uh, to have the benefit of the experience. So she's on a tricycle. And this is the first time I've ridden a bike in a long time. And so 
Uh, for us, it's really about creating these experiences, these demonstrations that really get equitable participation and equitable planning process um, out of community members or for this planning process. As a result of this, this project is actually, uh, it was initially scoped when the city um, had minor improvements. They allocated about $460,000, $440,000 for this project. By the end of it, um, all the community driven requests and planning and the different characteristics, uh, this project is now around 13 to $15 million. And so I'm excited to share with you all though that for the Southern Corridor, we have secured enough funding to build out the Southern Corridor. And so we're actually gonna be able to make this a reality. However, one of the things that, you know, is, is a bit discouraging because we, we have the sense of urgency around the climate crisis. This project was identified in 2010. However, it won't be constructed until about two, 2025, 2026, 2027, and it's 1.1 miles. We just can't afford to build projects that float. These projects, more of these projects need to be constructed in a faster timeline. Um, but when all said and done, uh, I think it's gonna really provide a lot of great benefits. Go ahead to the next slide, uh, to the community. Um, and so some of the challenges, we had like three people that all live in the same house that were against uh, people biking, but again, um, you know, we offered to take them on a bike tour, work alongside them, to work through their concerns. Um, and then also the national and local political climate made it challenging uh, to, to do some of this. However, uh, because we did so much community engagement, we were able to show directly this percentage of people support this design, this percentage of people support this design, this percentage of people support that design. And so ultimately that led the, the council, the South Amani City Council, to make the decision based on the community's interests and priorities for what the project was, and so it was able to move forward. So overwhelmingly, more than 80% uh, of folks wanted some type of protected bikeway. So everyone wanted a protected bikeway that included these multiple benefit characteristics and amenities um, that were featured on Merced Avenue. Go ahead and the next one. And then just the one thing that I also wanted to share with you is that, you know, we've, this is one example of a Greenway project, but we've done this iterative process for other parts, for other projects that include park equity work. And so working with uh, Amigos de los Rios, and the Almonte City School District through uh, a CAL FIRE grant, uh, they were actually able to get funding uh, to transform this campus into a green campus. We helped with the design of this bicycle skills course here that you see there. Uh, go ahead at the next slide. And so it's actually a campus where we teach people of all ages how to learn how to ride a bike, you know, regardless of ability or age for free. And this is a safe way. All these trees have grown and mature. They're now taller, they provide shade, they provide canopy, they're capturing water. The, the water used to go from the campus and into the storm drain. Now it's being captured. Um, so we're cleaning, you know, slow, slink and, slow stink and spread is the name of the game, storm water capture. And so really now it's become a, a really nice place, a really cool place. And the paint, paint that you see there is actually cool paint. So it's 15 to 18 degrees cooler than the blacktop uh, that it's like located next to. And Sarah, I see you. So I'm going to wrap up pretty soon. Okay. Uh, hit the next slide. And then in addition, around the soccer field at the same campus, we were able to build a, a pump track. So it's actually a, an introductory course to mountain biking, but it's one of the only uh, pump tracks, which is a bicycle skills course, essentially, or bike park or anywhere in the, in the United States where there's a bike park that's also located on a school campus. And so Really, it's about maximizing the resources that we have to build multiple benefit approaches so that we meet the multiple needs of, of communities. So like, you know, workforce development, SG San Gabriel Valley Conservation Corps um, has been working on, on the tree planting. We've hired people to help with the maintenance of this park and the programming of this park for trying to get additional funding to support the park. So really, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of need, but really the taking this community-driven approach to make sure that it's participatory, that equity is centered, and that we're able to lead with our values and provide capacity strengthening opportunities for communities really how we think we're gonna be able to do this, tackle the climate crisis because it's really gonna take a collective. So go ahead to the next slide. Um, so with that, thank you. Uh, Sarah, I think I'm 15 minutes so more or less, but uh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're basically spot on. So <laughs> awesome. That's really incredible, um, all that you just shared, David. And now we are going to go next to Tracy. Great. Thanks, Sarah May. Hello, everyone. I'm Tracy Bartlett, and I am here representing Cactus to Cloud Institute. 
And thank you to Dr. Marylander for our uh, opportunity to present to you today. We're very excited to be here. So I would like to introduce our Cactus to Cloud team. And we are a small group, we're fairly new, and we are working on our not-for-profit status as we speak. We are a community-based solution for building climate resiliency. I'd like to introduce the four of us uh, that have been the founding members. I'd like to introduce Colin Barrows, Sandy Barrows, myself, and Elizabeth Ogren Erickson. We, uh, and this is the Coachella Valley. We're located in the Coachella Valley. And if you know, we're in the up, uh, lower Sonoran Colorado desert uh, between uh, the San Jacinto, Santa Rosa, and little San Bernardino ranges. So we are a very unique and uh, biodiversity hotspot. So our goals uh, are really uh, to celebrate the unique animals, the trails, the plants, and the people living in the Coachella Valley and to, to really build relationships between them. Next slide. Because we believe that by celebrating the, the uniqueness of our valley, it's really, we really want to foster an appreciation for the desert because it's home to nine cities. We are a biodiversity hotspot with plants and animals that are found nowhere else in the world. We live in an area that has multiple eco zones from the valley floor to the mountain tops. And by fostering this appreciation, we want, really want to educate residents and our visitors. We get visitors from all over the world on how biodiversity works and why it's so important to uh, the health of our, our communities, our planet. And so we hope our efforts translate into a movement of conservation that help build a resilient community for, for everyone. So part of our goal uh, to do that is to connect with professional researchers and community scientists to utilize science-based uh, science methods to better understand and protect our de desert. Next slide, please. Sorry, Tracy. <laughs> That's okay, no worries. <laughs> there we go. All right, so we also, one of our goals is to collaborate. Uh, right now we're a small group, small but mighty. And our goal is to collaborate with other organizations to benefit the Coachella Valley with the intention of being inclusive and helping to diversify the outdoors. We have uh, many Latinx families in our East Valley and engaging them. Uh, their children in in these goals is, is extremely important and something we really want to we really want to focus on next slide please so some of the things we've been able to do so far and let me tell you we have had a lot of fun doing it uh, we are um, we have done some outdoor education content for social media we have YouTube videos. Uh, this one with my mouth open is uh, one that we did on uh, safe hiking in the desert. We have Instagram posts, we're on Twitter, and we have been, uh, you know, outdoor education, uh, and again, doing some naturalist based education uh, and community science is, is something that we are, are, uh, are continuing to do. Next slide, please. Something else we do and have been doing are working on to do more of is community outreach presentations. Uh, as you can see, uh, Colin Barrows uh, continues to present on Sky, Sky Islands and Climate Refugia in the deserts of Southern California. And Elizabeth Ogren Erickson uh, presents on the desert is not deserted. The desert is a place full of life from cactus to, cactus to clouds and everything in between. Next slide, please. Other, uh, the, as I indicated, very important that we connect with the community science research projects. So some of the things that we've been involved in, uh, uh, Colin and Cindy did their, um, uh, their capstone uh, from the climate stewards class on uh, park resilience rating in the East Valley. 
Uh, we've done a number of iNaturalist projects uh, in the Valley. Um, I actually set up one myself for my neighborhood so that I could start to track uh, the different plants and animals that I see there uh, in terms of the diversity and what we're seeing in terms of what types of wildlife actually can ex coexist with neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Another thing we've been doing is doing collaborative outdoor learning experiences uh, with the uh, uh, Latino Conservation Week. Colin and Cindy led a group at the Whitewater Preserve doing some naturalist uh, chats and leading some hikes and walks for families. Uh, even though it was a little warm out, it was a beautiful day and everyone had a really good time. So see, these are some of the organizations that we are collaborating with. And certainly it's, uh, it's not, um, there, there will be more, we hope. Uh, MDLT in the, in the high desert, uh, Hispanic Access Foundation, Conservation Lands Foundation, a number of, uh, of organizations uh, to collaborate with to really bring these groups together for the good of our community and our desert. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that's very important uh, are some of the collaborative projects that we are doing with the UC Riverside Palm Desert Center, the Center for Conservation Biology, and hopefully more. Um, we've started, uh, UCR Palm Desert has started a climate stewards working group, and the working group that Colin will be heading up is the Urban Refugia, and uh, Elizabeth and I will be uh, assisting, be in, uh, will be on that group as well. Uh, we are... Uh, currently working on a uh, revisiting the desert wilderness project, uh, restoring the elephant forest, and hopefully we'll be able to be engaged with uh, other projects, uh, ECR and the, the CCB. Obviously, most of us have been on surveys with Dr. Barrows, and uh, we're continuing to, uh, to continue that relationship. Next slide, please. Uh, maybe. And the next slide will actually show you our team, I believe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, the, uh, the PowerPoint has come to a standstill. There we the go. <laughs> uh, our team. Uh, we were out uh, filming in uh, the East Valley out at Coral Mountain. Uh, Colin Barrows, myself, Cindy Barrows, and Elizabeth Ogren Erickson. And we are the we are also the board of directors and are working, like I said, on our nonprofit status as, at this, as we speak here. And again, next slide, we are on social media. So please take time to take a look at our website. And again, we'll be working on uh, more website activities. Uh, you know, our hope is to engage with uh, young people, students. Uh, we're on Twitter and uh, Instagram. And we, uh, you know, in, in the future, we'd like to have more volunteers with us and um, really have a really robust group working together to make the Coachella Valley a, a fantastic and climate resilient place to live. And I, and I do have to share one thing with you. My favorite quote of all times is from Margaret Mead, and I truly believe it. And it's, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I truly believe that, we believe that, and I think that all of you out there, I just encourage you, if you have ideas that, of your own, um, I would just encourage you to take the step. Thank you, everyone. I've really enjoyed being here with you today and uh, look forward to talking to you and networking with, with more of you. Cool. Thank you so much, Tracy, finishing us up with your presentation. And thank you to David and thank you to Adina. You have presented us some just really awesome stories of hopeful actions that people are taking across the state. And I think that's what we often need to hear amongst all of the other media that is going on out there. And and truly, that is what the book, uh, Climate Stewardship, Taking Collective Action to Protect California, is about. It is those positive, hopeful, motivating stories um, to encourage us to action. 
And um, I just want to encourage folks, if you do have a question for any of our three presenters, if you could just pop that into the chat. Um, Adina, we did have a question come in earlier regarding a recent article in um, the LA Times. Um, I'm not sure if you've read that article or would care to comment. <laughs> okay, we can come back to that maybe at Maybe someone can share point. the link and I can catch up with me later. I'm happy to read it. Yeah, sounds good. We do have, um, we did pop that story link in the chat so we can connect that to you um, a little bit later. Um, and, oh, there's a message from uh, Sherry Tyndall to Tracy about the local uh, resource conservation districts. Um, I will share quickly, um, you know, Tracy mentioned um, the work that she did um, with the capstone projects and that Colin and Cindy did with the capstone projects um, for the UC Climate Stewards course. I am just popping some uh, link in there if you want to find out more about that course and the work that's being done there. Cindy, did, I mean, Tracy, did you want to share anything about um, the course you took or kind of where things are building out um, from the community that you've uh, connected to there? Yeah, absolutely. It was a wonderful course. I would encourage everyone to take it. I think it, it, it not only opened up my eyes, but, you know, once the course was over, there was so much excitement, enthusiasm about doing something and that's really how you know as we start talking and we all come together and realize that there are things we can do in our communities and that's what's really important to know and you know the resources that we were uh that that prepared us uh, everything from how to do a presentation to you know how to talk to people who don't believe that that climate change is is, is here uh really invaluable for all of us so i would just encourage everybody if you haven't taken it do it's fabulous. And, and if you haven't taken the naturalist course, if there's anybody out there that has a fabulous course. So the two uh, really go hand in hand and, and uh, have really helped all of us to I, I move forward with our work. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tracy. Um, again, if you have any questions, please pop those into the chat. I just wanted to ask David, um, you know, you mentioned that it took um, it started in 2010, this project, and we're 11 years down the road, and it's going to take a few more until some of the construction happens. I know, you know, some of this can take a long time, and I'm just curious, how have you maintained your hope, and you're so positive, and the work that the community is doing, you know, you, you've connected with the community in a way, and, and they're, you know, they're pushing, they're trying to make it happen. In the face of, you know, some of these difficulties, you know, how do you keep going? I think it's really um, it's really important to be transparent and be able to manage expectations about how long these projects are going to take. And so we're upfront about that, you know, making sure that folks recognize it's going to take some time. Because sometimes folks are like, it's next year. Why isn't it done? Well, that's because right now it's like funded through five different funding sources with different timelines that will fund different components of the project that we then need to cobble up together to mix and match to make the act project actually go. And I think for us, uh, one of our strengths is that we're rooted in the San Gabriel Valley. We're focused on investment in these communities that are of most need. And so this is one of many projects that we're working on in this community of South Almani. And so, um, you know, it helps be a constant presence. So right now, because of the need, we've shifted our focus to doing COVID-19 vaccination work, right? Because the folks that live there are some of the folks that also have the lowest access. And so we've been helping folks get vaccinated, staying connected, staying visible, being a resource to folks. Um, so I think for active SGV, and I love the quote that, that Tracy mentioned because you know that's really what we are. It's, we're all a collection of San Gabriel Valley residents that have been born or raised in and around the community taking collective action to see the change they wanna see in the world. And in particular, we believe the climate crisis to be the biggest challenge for all of us, right? Um, so, so yeah, I think that that really helps. So we communicate about this project. We also do utility, energy related stuff. So utility service, we're doing electric car share program. We're also working with them um, on the COVID-19 vaccination. So really it's like we're an ongoing presence in the community, community of South Amani. 
That's really great to hear. Um, you know, one of the guiding principles of the Climate Stewards course is really focusing on local place-shaped connections and, and making that community connection. And Adina, I just want to kind of give that back to you. You know, you talk to people across the entire state of California, and I'm just curious if, you know, you found those folks in those communities kind of echoing uh, what David just shared. Definitely. I know that David probably, I mean, he works with Pacoima Beautiful, and uh, I talked to Sophia Maldonado, and she's a mom of a couple of kids, and she just has such tenacity, goes door by door in Pacoima, um, really rallying folks to do something about the street safety issues, tree canopy, um, uh, they're also, of course, trying to get um, rid of the Whiteman Airport uh, that presents, you know, safety issues for that community as well as pollution. Um, so it seemed like when I was going to talk, you know, to the community members that I spoke with, uh, I, I just want to say, you know, it wasn't coincidence to me, the mother's out front. <laughs> and Sophia being a mom and, you know, parents really caring in general about the Next Generation, um, also Jennifer Calderon, who I mentioned, was a food preserver and worked for Glean Slow. She first started with her kids' gardens. Um, so, you know, David mentioned this multi-generational houses, multi-generational relationships. And I just, I saw a lot of that about people caring for families, neighbors, and, and crossing those generations was very, uh, important to the folks that I talked to and motivated them and and whether it was tree planters in um the you know south bay doing re-oaking or wherever I talked people really did mention youth children and that connection to the future yeah I I will briefly share my families from the mountains of North Carolina and you know from the stories they told and all the generations, I feel a connection, even though I've never lived there myself. So, um, Tracy, I just wanted to kind of connect this with you, too. You mentioned you started your own iNaturalist project for, like, your neighborhood to kind of find out what was going on with the plants and animals there. And I know a lot of us here are California naturalists, but the climate stewards don't connect with that iNaturalist project. So if you could share just a little bit about what iNat is and kind of what you're using oh, it sure. for. I, I'd love to, and, it's, and just so you know, I've done a small INAT video on our YouTube channel, so I have to plug that, but, you know, down, you know, having the iNaturalist resource, whether you are using it on a laptop or on your phone, and I, in fact, I was out walking, I'm actually in the middle of Wisconsin, and I was out walking, taking pictures of native plants, and the next thing I'm going to do is upload it to iNaturalist, but it's a great way to really enhance uh, the database of native plants and animals. And I would highly recommend people utilize it. I just set up a quick, a simple project and uh, mapped out what, and so I can look and see exactly what I've seen where and when and in my own neighborhood. And I would encourage everybody to do that. It's very simple, I mean, very simple to use. And uh, you can go to iNaturalist.com. You can download iNaturalist on your phone. Uh, and again, we have a video. And INAT actually has a new, uh, a new um, app out, and it's called uh, Seek yeah. by iNaturalist. So I, I have not used that one yet. I use iNaturalist uh, pretty much daily, as does Elizabeth and Colin and Cindy. So <laughs> I would <laughs> encourage everybody. There are also a number of projects. I mean, a number of projects out there that you can contribute to. So really, really recommend it. Uh, it, it, not only do you learn from it, you learn, oh, you know, I'm out hiking today and I don't know what this wildflower is. So I take a picture loaded to iNaturalist and then suddenly I know what that flower is and I can teach somebody else. And I think that's the one thing that I took away from the iNaturalist course is I really wanted to teach others about the natural world because I think, again, the more we all know, the, more, the better we can do. So uh, iNaturalist yeah. is an awesome way to get started. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Tracy. Really mm -hmm. appreciate that. Well, I just want to wrap us up today. Yes, by Sarah, May, I, I want to yes. thank especially Tracy and David for joining me today. I want to say that 
you know, while I can weave a little bit of science in here and there, um, your stories, David, Tracy, and everyone in this Zoom room um, are very, very powerful. And we're a community of people who share across our community. Um, so thank you, thank you, um, both David and Tracy, but also all of our um, naturalists and stewards and everyone who's always willing to jump on, help somebody else, share your story. It's way more powerful than anything we can teach from UC. So thank, you. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I just want to thank you so much for all three of you for being here today. Thank all of you who are here um, watching for participating. We hope to see you all again, and we really want to hear your thoughts about today's presentation and your ideas moving forward with the Cone series. Uh, if you'd like to register for the next Cones webinar, I have dropped that link into the chat, and I also just dropped the uh, link for the evaluation into the chat as well. Um, registration is now open for the September 14th Cones, which is celebrating California Biodiversity Day, biodiversity in your spaces. So very apropos to some of the things we talked about today. Um, you can join this Cones uh, to learn how five California naturalists and climate stewards course partners are using participatory science projects to increase understanding and awareness of biodiversity issues in their unique bioregion. The annual California Natural Resources Agency sponsored California Biodiversity Day celebrates our state's exceptional biodiversity while also encouraging actions to protect it. Uh, be on the lookout for guest blog posts in early September from naturalists and stewards celebrating their favorite bioregions as well. So it was great to see everyone today and thank you so much for joining us and I would like to send you off uh, for the next month just thinking about um, how you connect with your community and uh, happy to be here and see all of you that are part of this community of naturalists and stewards. So thanks so much and have a great rest of your day.